if you're looking for airdrops, I would check out, you know, what other Solana dApps are doing. Which reminds me, we have just stealthily launched a new section of our website. We haven't really publicized it yet because it's not 100% ready, but I'll give you the scoop. We have an airdrops and yield section on the website. This is a summary of our DeFi Alpha, that's our paid newsletter, and we give you all of the potential airdrops that are coming out same with the yield section great kind of yield opportunities for eth uh, stable coins and other major tokens so you have all of that handily summarized in one place hi everyone welcome to a new episode of crypto with kami where we go over the biggest news and headlines of crypto and DeFi. we'll be going over the biggest news of the week of november 27th, um, talking about the Kyber hack, but specifically how the hacker is sending some uh, really interesting messages on chain. Uh, we'll be talking about the Ave stablecoin Go, the um, activity picking up on the NIR protocol, uh, Solana's uh, project Gido doing an airdrop, uh, the Cosmos fork. Um, Vitalik's techno optimism post and a, a bit of game fine news. So yeah, let's jump to it. Um, all right. So this Kyber hacker messages are super interesting. The latest that we got um, was on Thursday morning, late uh, Wednesday night Eastern. Um, so okay, basically a bit of background. Kyber is uh, one of the the earliest or one of the first AMMs uh, to exist in DeFi, one of the first decentralized exchanges. It was uh, founded in or launched in 2018. Um, it's it's it ha never got as big as as Uniswap, but it is pretty you know long-standing DEX in the space, and it got um, attacked uh, last week. Uh, with 48 million of uh, funds stolen from the DEX across various chains, inc including Ethereum. Um, it's, you know, very unfortunate, but not, un not unfortunately such an uncommon thing to happen in DeFi. Um, what's more uncommon is the, just the kinds of messages that the hacker is sending. Um, and just, you know, a reminder that um, anyone executing an, a transaction on chain is able to input uh, a message on that, uh, on that transaction, um, on kind of the data field on that transaction. And you can easily see that uh, on Etherscan. So it's been a, 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 an increasingly common way for hackers of DeFi to leave messages for the public or for the protocols themselves. This has been a just like a very interesting trend um, that's uh, that's become more and more common for hackers to uh, start negotiating with the protocol that they're attacking via these messages. And it usually does work out that the um, the protocol team. Uh, agrees to give um, give the uh, the attacker a percentage of the funds that it drained in exchange for them returning most of the funds and um, and so the agreement is made that nobody's you know uh, pressing charges or or going after the hacker um, after this agreement so that's kind of the the usual way that these exchanges go but in this case, the Kyber hacker went a step further and is actually demanding to take control and ownership over the Kyber protocol and company itself, um, which is, is definitely a first. Very brazen of this hacker uh, to do this. Um, so they, they sent a, a list of demands um, they said they want 
complete executive control over Kyber the company. They want temporary full authority and ownership over Kyber DAO to enact legislative changes. Uh, and they want all legal documentation pertaining to the the company's um, you know legal uh, structure and so on. They want all of Kyber's on-chain and off-chain assets. Um, and then they are so gracious, quote unquote, to offer severance packages to employees who uh, want to leave. Uh, they offer to buy out executives uh, of the company, just like very crazy. Uh, I don't know what they expect to come out of this or why they think the uh, you know Kyber team will agree to these demands. Um, I mean, there are more and more sophisticated ways of catching on-chain um, attackers. I'm sure, you know, it's very likely that if Kyber went after this, this hacker, they'd end up catching him. Uh, so I'm not sure why he or, or he or she or they believe they have such uh, leverage over Kyber to be able to make these demands. So, you know, I don't see this uh, succeeding. Uh, of course, we'll see. Uh, but I think what's what's interesting is just this trend of, uh, you know, these negotiation tactics by hackers becoming almost the norm in uh, these kinds of attacks. So we'll keep you posted on how this uh, story develops. Um, what's next? On the, the protocol side of, of news, uh, there, there was um, a, 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 a huge effort behind getting the Aave stablecoin Go, uh, that's GHO, uh, to uh, climb back to, or not back to, but climb to a parity with the US dollar. So, um, Ave a few months ago launched a stablecoin called Go, and Ave is you know the uh, one of the largest or, or uh, has mostly been the largest lending protocol in in DeFi. So they launched this stablecoin, uh, but uh, it's been very hard for it to maintain a peg to the US dollar. And in our story, we explore the reasons why it's had trouble uh, maintaining that peg. Uh, basically, there's not much uh, that traders can do with Go. Uh, they can't use it as collateral in many places. They can't get uh, a lot of yield with it. So the, there isn't much demand for Go. Um, and that's why it's struggled to maintain the peg uh, with US dollar. So um, there was this kind of committee that formed to get Go back back to its peg uh, with a so-called you know benevolent dictator, a, a token Bryce, who um, a, kind of applied for this position to lead the charge in getting Go back to peg. Um, he was awarded that position, uh, and uh, this kind of executive committee formed um, because the kind of um, it, it, the the task of of getting go back to peg wasn't being achieved in um, a kind of in, in a decentralized way. So they they decided they needed a more executive kind of uh, body to do this. And so Token Bryce took on the the leadership of this, and they had a deadline for for go to get back to peg, um, which was, uh, I believe November, yes, it was November 30th, uh, with uh, the target of getting go to 0.985 uh, dollars. And uh, just, you know, a um, couple of days before the deadline, they actually achieved this. So um, right now, uh, go is right at, you know, 0.9835. Uh, this is yeah November 30, um, and it's kind of been hovering at that 0.98, uh, 98.2, 98.5 in for the past uh, few days. 
So yeah, it's um, it's great to see that this team was able to pull together um, and really um, was very effective in the measures that they took uh, to get go up from where was it? It was at point uh, nine six to uh, they got it up to point nine eight um, in in a, in a few days. Uh, so you know. The, the main things that they did is that they uh, they applied incentives obviously uh, to it so now there there's incentives on the maverick uh, protocol uh, to um, to uh, borrow go and uh, there's also a uh, there's also a limit for um, for the, the the issuance of go so that also just it puts more pressure on on uh, gold price to increase. For whoever wants to take advantage of this, uh, the yield options on um, Maverick Protocol for Go range between 34 and 45 percent. And um, Mark Seller, who we interviewed for this story, um, said, you know, it it's not sustainable to incentivize uh, Go. Uh, this much for so long so um you know it, it will only be for a limited time but there there will have to be more sustainable demand for go uh, going forward um so i think it, there there will have to be an effort to integrate uh, go into more and more uh, DeFi protocols um to uh, make it more productive in order uh, for there to again for there to be demand it can't rely on having these um high uh, high incentives because you know incentives run out and then you know you're you're just back to square one so there will have to be some sort of more sustainable organic demand for go for it to actually retain its uh, one dollar peg uh, but so far this this committee it has been really effective, so um, I'm sure that they are they are on top of this and, and thinking of further ways to uh, incentivize Go and to make it uh, make it more useful uh, across DeFi. Um, now moving on to we have a, a few layer one news. Um, it's it's interesting that there you know. There seems to be a, a lot of increased activity in alt, let's say alt l layer ones, uh, which I'm describing as um, non-Bitcoin, non-Ethereum. Non uh, and I remember, I mean, there was a, a, a short time frame recently where I saw this narrative come up that... Um, non-Ethereum, non-Bitcoin layer ones were kind of dead and that all of activity would happen on Ethereum rollups. Well, recently, I think that narrative is, at least for now, proven wrong because we've seen just so much activity happening on uh, alt layer ones. Uh, we saw Solana really take the spotlight in the past uh, few weeks. Um, and now we're seeing near also uh, climb in in different key metrics, which you know pretty uh, unexpected. I I at least hadn't thought about near uh, for a while. Um, it hadn't been making much news, but uh, we were surprised to see just this jump in activity in terms of daily active addresses and daily transactions. So near active addresses are actually beating out uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, it's also beating Solana in daily active addresses, which uh, was surprising. I think it's it's only second to Tron, and it's tying with uh, BNB Chain. Um, and then the other metric the that's growing for near is daily transactions. So also just uh, beating out Ethereum, beating out Bitcoin, um, uh, but still lagging Solana, Tron, and the BNB chain. Looking at just like the major layer one uh, uh, protocols. Uh, 
uh, sorry, layer one chains. Um, so what's driving this activity? It's mainly two applications. It's a Kai Kai Now, which is a payment uh, application, and it's Sweatcoin, which is this um, move to earn, if you will, DAP. Uh, it's it's a DAP that kind of incentivizes exercise, uh, I believe. Um, and that's you know that those two apps are making up a really large chunk of activity on, on near, I think it's like 90% um, uh, of activity there. Um, but still, I mean, even if it's those two dApps, they are two very successful dApps, uh, which are, they are, um, they're kind of real world applications. They're not uh, DeFi or GameFi. They have to do with, again, like real world payments uh, with this kind of exercise uh, dApp. So it, it's interesting. It's an interesting use case. That's something that we don't see very often in uh, layer one chains. Um, so just, you know, something to watch activity on uh, near uh, picking up. Uh, now on Solana, uh, it looks like it's having a bit of a uh, airdrop season. So Jito, which is the second largest uh, dApp on Solana after Marinade, um, announced a, a new token and an airdrop. Uh, Jito produces infrastructure for Solana. It's, um, it builds kind of MEV protection and it has a liquid staking token called... Um, Jito Sol uh, token, but now it's it announced it's launching a, a governance token JTO separate from Jito Sol, which is already live, and these uh, these new tokens JTO token um, it will have a supply of one billion, ten percent of which will be airdropped to users who have contributed to the Jito network uh, development. The snapshot for the airdrop was already taken on November 25th. So unfortunately for all of you listening, it's a bit late if, if you haven't already participated in, um, in, the, uh, in, in, in the Jito network. Um, but yeah, interesting to see airdrops happening on Solana. They're kind of taking the same model uh, that Ethereum dApps uh, took early on, which is doing a snapshot and seeing uh, users, you know, rewarding users who participated in in the DAP um, retroactively. So, you know, I would, if you're looking for airdrops, um, I, I would check out, you know, what other Solana uh, DAPs uh, are doing and, you know, uh, if if it makes sense to participate in any of those. Um, which reminds me, uh, we have just stealthily launched a new section of our website. We haven't really publicized it yet because it's not 100% ready, but I'll give you the scoop now. For those listening, we have an airdrops and yield section on the website. Um, for those of you watching this on YouTube, uh, I'll, um, I'll show you here. It's on our menu. The uh, it's a drop down. It says airdrops yields. If you go to airdrops, this is a summary of our DeFi Alpha. That, that's our paid newsletter, um, and we give you uh, all of the potential airdrops uh, that are uh, coming out. And then same with the yield section, we uh, give you great kind of yield opportunities for ETH, uh, stable coins, and other major tokens. Um, so you have all of that handily uh, summarized in one place. So we really hope that this is useful to DeFi and crypto users. We really think it is. Uh, so check it out. So that's Solana, um, other layer one news. Um, Cosmos uh, co-founder Jay Kwan proposes to fork the network. He was uh, 
in disagreement over a proposal that passed to cut uh, Adam in inflation. Adam is Cosmos' uh, native token, um, so he is rallying his supporters to fork the network. Uh, we'll keep you posted on, you know, uh, how that goes. Really interesting development. Of course, Cosmos is one of the the biggest um, uh, layer one ecosystems. So we'll see what uh, if you know this fork succeeds or not. Um, next, uh, this super interesting post by Vitalik, uh, Ethereum co-founder and creator. Uh, he has a, a a philosophy that he's uh, proposing called defensive acceleration. Uh, it's either defensive decentralization or differential acceleration. D slash ACC. Uh, it's uh, a post on uh, techno optimism. So to give a, a, a bit of background, uh, this is in line with what uh, Mark Andreessen posted recently. He had this techno optimism uh, blog post where, you know, Mark Andreessen, Sam Altman, um, and a few others uh, VCs and uh, and founders are of this kind of line of thinking, the uh, techno optimist line of thinking, that basically goes like this. It says, you know, technology is a net positive for the world. We should do everything to uh, advance technology um, because it, the outcomes will be. Uh, will greatly outweigh any negatives that might come with technological developments. The counter argument to that is, you know, people who say technology can have very negative effects on humans and on the, uh, development. And so uh, technological developments cannot come at any cost, like it, it, we need to set up guardrails around it. Um, and, and this becomes more interesting and more relevant given what, what happened with uh, OpenAI and the ouster of Sam Altman from the company, uh, because uh, apparently Sam Altman is from the techno optimist side, like he wants to push AI to its uh, maximum state uh, no matter what happens, no matter what the consequences are, um, this is this isn't exactly confirmed. That apparently, from what's come out of all the, those discussions, uh, it looks like part of the board, uh, the 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 um the the part of the board that was on on the um, on the side of making OpenAI a nonprofit foundation, uh, they were kind of more cautious about the development, about the uh, the consequences that developing a super intelligent AI could, could have. And so there was this tension between developing AI to its fullest or being more careful with it. Um, and so initially it looks like the, the cautious side had temporarily, temporarily won out, pushing Sam Altman out, but then, as, as we all know, um, he was reinstated. So anyways, this whole techno-optimism debate uh, has been uh, going on and, and kind of um, was, was further uh, highlighted with this whole uh, uh, issue with, um, with OpenAI. It became more relevant. And so it's interesting to see what Vitalik's uh, what Vit Vitalik's position is on this, and he he's um, he stands somewhere in the middle. Like he uh, is definitely m in the middle, but like more towards the effective ac uh, accelerationist. Um, sorry, ef effective acceleration side, the EAAC side, which is what Mark Andreessen um, adheres to, and and maybe some Altman. Um, uh, than to the anti EAAC side, uh, but he he he's not he he still advocates for a more careful development 
of um, of technology, specifically AI. So what Vitalik says is that there is a risk that if AI reaches its full potential, that it overtakes human intelligence and ends up controlling humans. And that this in the hands of um, a centralized uh, party or a centralized organization can be a huge threat to human life. And so as a way to prevent this or, or a hedge against this uh, would be to have more decentralized governance uh, structures. And that's obviously where uh, blockchain and crypto uh, come in. So that's why his position on technological advancement and development um, is, he calls it defensive or decentralization acceleration, because it's accelerating technological development, but introducing this element of decentralization, which can uh, be a way to defend humans against some um, super intelligent AI uh, robot that can overtake humanity. Um, so we have a, a summary here on, on the post, which is a very, very long, uh, long post by Vitalik. Uh, so check it out or definitely read the post itself, which is super interesting. Um, now, uh, uh, we have this, uh, news about web three gaming company, Oh baby partnering with Paramount. Just wanted to quickly point this out because we think that GameFi is going to be, um, a, a trend that will uh, start picking up again, uh, in, um, in as, as we maybe are heading into a bull market, uh, GameFi is, you know, these things that come and go uh, with crypto cycles. Apparently, now, finally, crypto and blockchain games are actually fun to play, which was not the case in the previous bowl. Um, so maybe they have a, a more, a, a chance to to actually, you know, actually get, get a more mainstream adoption, uh, which you know, hasn't been the case so far. Uh, so that's just a, a trend to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, recently there was this, uh, like I said, this partnership between Obaby and Paramount, the, the major studio. And finally, um, there is this uh, story on, on the latest controversy with Blast. Uh, for a bit of background, uh, for those uh, of you who missed it, Blast is a new layer two. They are backed by Paradigm, uh, the famous uh, venture capital firm. Um, and yeah, they, they came out very loudly announcing their, uh, their launch, uh, announcing that they are backed by Paradigm. Um, everyone kind of uh, jumped in. Uh, they, they were very much criticized because they are, they're a layer two, uh, but there's no actual network or, uh, anything yet. Uh, it's just, uh, a wallet that people can send money to. It's a one way street. So people can send money, but they cannot withdraw. And the idea is that they'll be able to withdraw when the Layer 2 launches, uh, I believe, in February. Um, and the idea is that if, if you send money, uh, that money will be deposited in Lido or in Maker to get that uh, additional yield. And of course, you'll get Blast tokens. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you look at their website, there isn't much anything on the tech, on why it's um, better than other layer twos, other than the fact that, that they are issuing these incentives. So a lot of people have come out and criticized it, saying um, it, it kind of seems like a pyramid scheme, uh, like a Ponzi. Uh, you know, there isn't much there except 
incentives and rewards. There, there's even a sort of referral program, which raised a lot of flags. Um, so anyways, it, it didn't get the best reception uh, in crypto when, when they launched. And, um, and so there was also this question of, you know, has Paradigm lost its touch? Like, it has it lost the mark? Um, is it just backing any shiny new thing with a promise of a token? Uh, and so Dan Robinson uh, from Paradigm uh, wanted to kind of uh, say that they disagree with with a lot of the the marketing and with a lot of the with many of the decisions that uh, Blast made at at the launch, which to me, I mean, it's it's pretty shocking to see a VC publicly come out and criticize a portfolio company. I mean, you, I mean, that's usually done quietly. Um, uh, of course, like VCs can disagree and, and uh, give founders advice and um, it, it's appreciated, uh, but to do it publicly, uh, I think it just shows that there was so much a backlash um, that Blast was received so poorly, it was starting to damage Paradigm's name uh, because Blast just like very clearly uh, positioned themselves like a Paradigm project and played that to their advantage um, and used that to uh, get almost or or about six hundred million dollars in funds to this contract and just you know, a week or so. Um, so it, it was starting to actually affect the paradigm name itself, um, that they were being used to attract all this money. So I think, you know, that's what prompted Dan Robinson to come out and just publicly say that they disagree with the marketing, that they disagree with the fact that this is a one-way street. Um, but just, you know, very interesting development, very interesting to see um paradigm kind of um distance themselves from some of the uh decisions that blast has taken now I i'll be interested to see um what the actual layer two looks like uh because i think paradigm are definitely smart people uh i don't think they would have backed this project just based off you know it's it's token incentives and uh and it's it's founding team, which uh, it's founded by um, by Pacman, who launched Blur. Blur, obviously, you know the NFT marketplace that took over OpenSea. So it's it's a it's a great uh, founding team. Um, but you know, I, I, hopefully, there's more to Blast than the founding team and the token incentives. So that's yet to be seen. But so far, um, it hasn't. Uh, it, it's not looking good, <laughs> to be honest, for for Blast. Um, so we'll see. Obviously, we'll we'll keep you posted uh, on on all of this and more. And uh, I'll see you all next week with all the latest DeFi news and headlines. Thanks so much.